the capital asset pricing model, also known as CAPM. Now, this builds directly on modern portfolio theory and was developed in the mid 1960s. Essentially, what the CAPM shows is what determines the price of individual assets in the marketplace. So we're gonna start off with the assumptions of the capital asset pricing model. So the assumptions are listed out here. Again, building on the modern portfolio theory. One, investors are risk adverse individuals, okay? Who maximize the expected utility of their end of period wealth. Two, investors are price takers and have homogeneous expectations about asset returns that have assumed to, to have a joint normal distribution. Three, there exists a risk-free asset in the market such that investors may borrow or lend an unlimited amount at this risk-free rate. Four, the quantities of assets are fixed and that all assets are marketable and perfectly divisible. Five, asset markets are frictionless and all information is costless and simultaneously available. Six, there are no market imperfections such as taxes, regulations, or restrictions to short selling. So, what's different between the MPT versus the CAPM? Well, essentially the MPT and the CAPM, here's the differences. MPT is the theory of describing demand for financial assets. Now, this can be thought of, again, as risk versus reward. So the CAPM is the theory that describes um, an equilibrium situation in financial markets. So further explaining this, it does this by making an assumption. And this assumption is that supply in the market equals demand. So breaking that down further, let's talk about the equilibrium condition. So in the equilibrium condition, this situation in the marketplace, supply equals demand. So the market portfolio consists of all existing financial assets in the marketplace and must coincide with this tangency portfolio. Now I'll explain what I mean by tangency portfolio in a second. But essentially this means everyone in the marketplace must own the entire market. So all assets are spoken for. So here we've got volatility versus returns. So we've got a risk-free asset on the left-hand side. We've got possible marketplace, tangency portfolio, is equal to the market portfolio. The line between them is called the capital market line. So before we get into the derivation, we just need to remember, do not forget this. Investors, the assumption is that they have a mean variance utility function. So what does that mean? Well, essentially it means investors have a quadratic Bernoulli utility. That's a bit confusing. It's other words explained as, yeah, random returns are normally distributed. So that's the big assumption. So now onto the derivation of the cap M. Let's get into the math. So first off, the problem formulation. Let's let X be the proportion of assets within a portfolio of asset I in the portfolio. Therefore, the sum of all those assets, one less the sum of all those assets, is going to be the proportion in the risk-free asset of the portfolio. So now, the return of that portfolio is just going to be the weighted sum of each of those returns in the portfolio. The variance of that portfolio is going to be sigma p squared, which is going to be the transpose of x times by that variance returns times by x. 
Now x is an n by 1 vector of proportions or weights, r is an n by 1 vector of returns, and 1 is an n by 1 vector of 1s, where the sum of all those proportions is equal to um, the transpose of x times that 1 matrices. So the expectation of returns is equal to this formula right here. So let's talk about the solution methodology. Essentially, it all comes down to investors choose a portfolio to minimize risk for a given return. Now, what is this risk? We're defining it as the square root of variance of the portfolio. So we're gonna use Langerian problems here and Lagrange multipliers. So we wanna minimize C, which is gonna be that variance squared plus the Lagrange multiplier times by the constraint, which is the expectation of the portfolio. So we wanna choose X and minimize um, C under these conditions. So we're gonna use Lagrange multiplier. So what that means is we take the first um, partial derivatives with respect to x and that Lagrange multiplier and make them equal to zero to minimize that function. So if you go into the math, you're gonna get these two functions here with deriving with respect to x and with deriving with respect to lambda. Now, the hardest part about that is what I've just highlighted there. Now, taking the partial derivative of the variance of the portfolio, you're best to do this by using the train, chain rule, but it is hard, so have a go by yourself. So after you take those partial derivatives, you get equations one and two. If we take one and we multiply by the transpose of x, we get the following. So the inverse of that sigma p times by the transpose of x variance x, which is actually just the portfolio variance. So we get the port, uh, we get sigma p minus the Lagrange multiplier of that equals zero. So the equilibrium portfolio, otherwise known as the market portfolio, is a specific circumstance of this where we don't have any proportion in the risk-free asset. So x transpose times uh, that one matrices is equal to one. So if you actually write out what that return is of the market, then the proportion there on the right hand side is equal to zero, and you just le are left with the following. The expected return of the market portfolio is the transpose of x times by the expected return of all the assets. Similarly, if you use that function there, you will get the sigma So now that we have equation three, we're going to sub that into equation one. So the standard deviation of the portfolio, remember that in, in equation one, we had uh, the risk-free rate plus one over the lambda or the Lagrange multiplier. So I've forgotten to do the plus there, but I'll add it back in a second. Now three is one rearranging three, you get one over the Lagrange multiplier equals that term there. And we're just gonna sub that in. So after you rearrange and sub in, you get that formula there. We're nearly there. All we need to do is notice the variance R times by X. Now, if we remember by definition that the variance of R is actually this expectation here, this is gonna help us. So the variance uh, of x times x is equal to the following. If we actually place that x within the expectation formula, we'll have to take it to the transpose there, but we end up with those two terms there, which if you remember from the other page, was just the market return and the expected market return. So then you end up with this formula and we realize that is just the covariance of all those assets with respect to the market returns. So now subbing that back in, we end up with a covariance divided by the variance of the market, which is really cool. So remember that the variance um, to the power of one was just equal to that, so that's how we ended up with the variance. So beta is equal to this function there that ratio. 
So the expected return is equal to the, the cap M formula as you've got there. The beta is just the N1 um, vector of parameters as you see. Thank you very much for watching. See you next time.